Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Oh, you're quiet. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm the psychologist, um, and I love products, but I love humans even more. And I love the combination of humans and products. And I'm going to talk a little bit today about the shaping of context and what do I mean by that. This is Martin's uh, circles. I took it from uh, his blog post. And I've been thinking a lot about what you do, and I work with product managers, but it, I, I sort of took my psychologist's lens and rethought about what, what kinds of things you do in your work. And sitting right in the middle there, it seems to me that you are translators. You're researchers, listeners, translators, storytellers, herders, and sort of vision setters. And um, I thought I'd sort of talk about three different aspects of my work um, and see how they might intersect with your work and some of the things that I think about. And I, I think storytelling, understanding, and engaging seem to be very much part of your work. And especially in the early days of building visions for products, and building visions for changing products and pushing products forward. So I think one of your jobs is to tell compelling stories to different audiences. The other is to understand your audience and your market, and that's really where a lot of my work has come in, understanding human-computer interaction, understanding people and how they interact with technologies. But it also seems to me, and I think Marty just made some lovely points about that, that you build team thinking and you get alliances and allegiances working. So a lot of persuasion and a lot of storytelling. And so today, I want to think a little bit about how storytelling happens from a sort of psychologist's perspective through metaphor. Because one of the things that we do to mobilize ideas into action and persuade others is to tell the metaphors and analogies to share those with people so that people get the point. You're always doing that translation work. I want to talk a little bit, not very much, about ethnography and the fact that design ethnography has been part of my career and my life all the way through. Really trying to get into the context of the people that we call users that we are building for and building with and participating with Especially now, we have so much data coming in from the ways that people use technologies. Data from the online interactions, from trying things out, and how we shape that data and contextualize that data with talking to people about the meaning that they find in using the tools and technologies. And how whatever we build always weaves in and out with other technologies. Finally, um, I'll talk very quickly about some of the tools and techniques that my team and my colleagues use for immersing ourselves and others into the experiences of others. So, you know, seeing data is something, but often role-playing and trying things out and trying other people's perspectives and taking roles helps us really get much more embodied and engaged with the ways that our users might feel. So first, storytelling. This is one of my favorite books. It was out a long time ago. Um, it's Lakoff and Johnson. And what they have looked at is metaphor. And I mentioned metaphor a moment ago. But what they say, it's not that the human brain starts off with some logical conclusion about the world. They say, and then, and then we add a metaphor to make it flourish. Maybe writers do that. But they say that metaphor is a fundamental part of our reasoning system. We reason through analogy, through metaphors. And those metaphors have consequences. Think about time is money. The minute you say that, you engage this idea that it's a limited resource and that it is a valuable commodity that you can exchange. Time is a prison, Nabokov said. What does that bring to mind? Does that make you feel trapped, wanting to break free? If time doesn't get your mind, 
What about a lyric from the 1980s? Love is a battlefield. How many of you have gone out on your first date with somebody with that in mind? <laughs> Maybe it didn't go so well. However, is, love is a many splendid thing. You might go in with a different orientation towards that date. So we live by metaphors. We shape the world and we experience the world through metaphor. We go forward through metaphor and we design through metaphor. And I think that's some of the work that you do to create, people, create people's metaphors. The horseless carriage was what this was described as. It looks very different from the self-driving cars that we have now, but it was a horseless carriage and its design borrowed from the horse and carriage. So there are many of these examples where we bring metaphor in, we bring analogy in, and we take those forward and then we reshape. We have a couple of cognitive biases. Metaphors frame the world, and I think your job is often to frame the world for people. We also have confirmation biases. So one of your jobs, I think, is to frame, but also get the data that you need to see if that's the right framing or not. And this is very hard for us to do as humans. There's a great study, I put the reference there, although the academics that did this work have drawn on a lot of work, prior work. And this is, um, they did five experiments, and they had two stories about a fictional town and the crime rate going up in that town. And one story used the analogy of a virus the other of a beast that was ravaging through the town. And then they asked people to generate solutions to the crime problem. And what they found consistently was the people who got the virus analogy wanted to go to the root cause. They wanted to think about inoculation strategies. They wanted to understand spread. They wanted to understand how to stop that spread and really deeply understand the move of this virus. The people who thought it was a beast consistently talked about hunting the beast down, eradicating the beast, fighting the beast. And it was really interesting that they had different solutions as to whether it required a few people to go and hunt the beast or a societal community response to the virus. And what was particularly interesting about this was people who got the analogy early then went off to do fact-checking, evidence-seeking around their potential solutions, and they framed their problem-solving strategy in terms of a confirmation bias to prove themselves correct as to what they thought needed to happen. People who got the analogy at the end were less inclined to do that. They were more open to more different kinds of information, to a potential reframing. So these frames that we have don't just lead to potential imagined solutions. They also lead to problem-solving strategies that confirm the solutions that we have proposed to ourselves. So I think, you know, in your world, a lot of what you need to do and what you do do is to think carefully about those framings and think carefully about the kinds of data from the different sources and the different disciplines that you're wrangling to make the next step. One might think about, for example, social networks. If you think of the social network in the diagram which has been drawn from an anthropological kinship model, you bake into the network the individual, the node, the person, having, having relationships to other people, and roles. You bake into the idea of the network a faceted identity where I might be somewhat different towards my family and my obligations and the enactments with them versus towards someone that I barely know who might be distantly related. But if you have a network model where everyone is a simple node with a connection, maybe you don't bake in those faceted, nuanced identities and different ways of relating at the very beginning, but later we ask people to declare whether you're a friend, an acquaintance, a close friend, a family member, 
because it's not baked in from the very beginning, it's something that you have to add on later. I am wrangling right now thinking about the metaphors that we're using for the so-called Internet of Things. And I think it's very interesting because a thing in our minds has a bounded box, right? It has a, it has a perimeter. However, what we know is that these perimeter objects, perimetered objects, aren't bounded. They're actually communicating with each other. And when we do a product design of a product, it's not a thing. It's part of a service ecosystem of things that talk to each other, things that have conversations all the way up and down the hardware, software, and interaction stack. These things are conversing. They have leaky boundaries. They're part of ecosystems and ecologies which are growing. Smart things grow and learn and change with each other. They sort of interpenetrate and affect each other. They're not just things. So there's some interesting different metaphors. When we talk to people, and we've done this with some interview studies, about smart homes, everyday users tend to think about the Internet of Things as this intertwined, unpredictable set of sort of animates that are sort of smart and are learning and have mysterious powers and might change. And we as individuals and we in the home are also intermixed with them. It's very much this sort of social and technical set of infrastructures and much more this sort of it's kind of a bit like magic. And so I think there's some interesting metaphors that people use, our users, our consumers, to understand that which we are designing for them and producing for them. And sometimes their metaphors are interesting to reflect on in terms of how transparent we make things. Another thing is the customer journey. My team and I have been talking a lot about this customer journey through a particular set of products or ecosystems. And when I talk to people and interview people, um, they often talk about it like, well, I'm hiking, I'm trudging through, trying to understand how all of these things fit together. It feels like I'm wayfaring and charting a sort of ever-changing ocean. And I think that's also interesting because that affects the way that we have people interact on an ongoing basis with the things that we produce and develop and change. So I just wanted us to sort of think about the metaphors that we use, that others use, that people invoke, that lead to mental models and the next steps in producing something or consuming something or combining different products. So in the next little phase here, I just want to talk about um, an understanding people. And I mentioned that um, ethnography has been a big part of my work life. I'm sort of calling it wide spectrum ethnography because although the original idea of somebody sort of observing from a distance um, might be in our minds as you know what anthropology and ethnography does, we now have huge amounts of data as I mentioned. But the data really, it doesn't sort of just come to us within science. We have to interpret the data at multiple levels of granularity multiple different ways of understanding people's behaviors. And we have to understand what peop why people do things as well as what they do. And this is really important because their stories, I mentioned their metaphors, but their stories of their journeys might well be helpful. Marty just mentioned that, you know, there's a big collaboration between business and engineering and design and user experience, and I think we often bring the stories from people of their experiences of our products to ground our use cases, our scenar scenarios, and our storyboards to move forward. And it's really important because they're not like us, our users and consumers, always. And sometimes we find really artful uses of the things that we might not have thought of that might sort of create a puzzle, which is a different one, which gives you adjacent businesses that you might not have thought that you were actually abutting, but might be extremely valuable. So my team have been out doing um, participant ethnographies where we get a bunch of people, they sign up, they spend several days with us using um, a couple of applications. One is an experience sampling application, and the other is a logging application. And 
the experience sampling application triggers at certain times or on certain actions, what are you doing right now? We also have diaries. We go in and interview people. And we capture everything that they've done on their personal devices. Not just what they're doing with our products, but what they're doing in general. Because our products fit into this lovely personal ecosystem of people's everyday lives, everyday tools, recreational experiences. And we want to know where we sit into that lovely ecosystem. And so we generate different kinds of data, and we try to do some interpretation, but we also have people tell us about their interpretation. We look at different kinds of data representation. Back to persuasion tools, all of these different kinds of representations are ways of showing what somebody has done through their day on these different applications. We have people go through with us what those applications were, what their experience was. So they've been with us for a week doing these experience sampling activities, doing diaries activities, We've done some representations of various different kinds. It seems to me that you opened Facebook 15 times today. It seems to me you were reading your mail a lot. It seems to me you were on a dating site. Hopefully not thinking love is a battlefield. And we sit with people and we ask them to tell us what and why and how their stories of what happened. And these tools, these visualizations, are part of our translation work because we scrub all of the information, we anonymize as much as we can, and we render these visible to the other team members. So we have a site where people can come, and if you're a designer or an engineer, and you're curious about a user journey, you can go in and have a look at a single participant, a single person who's been part of our study, who's given us consent to share their data, whose data we've scrubbed of private information. But you as an engineer can go and say, this is one customer's journey. This is one person's journey through a week of a myriad applications and devices. But we also can aggregate and have a look at all of the folks that we've engaged and say, here are some patterns that seem to be everybody's patterns. And so far, we've done several of these studies. Everybody is sort of a wide variety of different kinds of folks, from um, you know, people who are on um, emergency hotlines to people who are um, engineers to you know, people who are bus drivers, trying very different kinds of slices of life to understand what's going on. So having sort of generated um, people's own stories, having worked in a participatory design way with people to understand their lives. Um, one of the other things to then do is to really get everyone on board in the team. And as I said, I think one of the great skills you all have is telling stories, grounding stories, but then getting other people on board. And so one of the ways that we sort of do this is dog fooding. I'm sure most of you in the audience know what dog fooding is, right? So trying out your own stuff. It's so important to try it out, as you know, just to see what that experience might be and put yourself in the shoes of the person that you're designing for. Even if you're designing for a market where you're not one of the market segment, you're not representative, it's still interesting to try things out and really sort of get yourself in those shoes. And we've been doing that with both the, the tools that we're using and the experiences we're giving people, but also we've been looking at our own data and, and trying out um, these visualizations and looking back at our own selves. And uh, one of the things I like to say is that two characteristics of humans is sort of vanity and voyeurism. We like to look at ourselves and other people. <laughs> so this actually turns out to be a kind of interesting exercise because uh, sometimes you look back and you go, oh, I spent quite a lot of time on that this week, reading the newspaper when I was supposed to be working. And I think those kinds of reflections are super interesting because it also helps you see where you are and are not like others that we're designing for. 
The other way that we really try to get others on board is through design sprinting. And the design sprint as an activity, as it, as it suggests, is like a sort of development sprint, but it's a very quick turnaround of ideas and idea sharing. And it came originally as a practice from Google Ventures, um, but it's been taken up and is being used in many different spaces and places. The idea here is to generate an idea and learn from it without building and launching. We know it's extremely expensive to build. Good engineers, good designers, great product managers. So that's a lot of expensive time to build something and then to launch it and learn from it. You certainly need to do that and you're going to do it, but the design sprint can get you trying out prototypes very, very quickly. And it's a five-phase framework, um, understanding, sketching, deciding, prototyping, and validating. The understanding of the problem might, for example, bring together the business and engineering and the audience data that we've already been collecting, perhaps for other reasons. Sketching is about bringing up the different ideas and everybody in the team who's in the design sprint of, say, you know, 10 to 15 people will sketch ideas around solutions and around di dimensions and directions we could go in. And then there's a decision made about which to go forward with. Prototypes may be really simple. They may be sketches that you step through. They may be simple prototypes, sort of Wizard of Oz, where there is no background, there's no engineering, but you've just got a very simple experience. And then the validation includes bringing in the users that you are intending to design for um, and having them step through what you got right and wrong. The original design sprint was five days. There's a three-day version as well because we know time is very precious. Um, but it really gets everyone involved. And the trick here really is to have different stakeholders and different roles in the room. User experience as well, but these are just three of the kinds of examples of different people with different facets and different ideas of the context of their work and different perspectives. And one of my favorite activities is to get those people switched up a little. There's this activity called the thinking hats. Um, Sometimes it's six, sometimes it's five. I've just put the five one up here. And in this instance, you get people to take different roles. Remember I was talking about that immersion in taking a perspective? You've done some dog feeding before, you've got this sort of perspective. But here, you might assign to people the role of an idea generator. You might have, you're the optimist and you're the pessimist. And your role is to play that out in discussion. You might have somebody who's looking at technical feasibility and you know, somebody who's the user advocate. And you take these roles and you play them out. And what's lovely about that is you start to see how people reason and how they position themselves and how they think. And this is extremely good for helping getting language alignment, perspective alignment, building trust, and building literacy across dis disciplines so that we actually can be faster next time around in the collaboration. So in summary, I just want to wrap up and just say, um, I just try to give you my perspective of some of the, on some of the things that I think that you all excel at and some of the things that I've experienced in, from my user experience and psychologist perspective are some of the important aspects of those. The first is storytelling. I think telling stories is how we communicate as humans. I think metaphors are often how we create a sort of vision, a shared vision, and bring people who might not have been thinking through the problem from that high strategic level that you have in mind on board and say, hey, it's like when this, or hey, we should be thinking like that, or that's interesting, here's a model around you know, time as a resource. What's your perspective on that? And then thinking through whether the right metaphor, the right analogy is the one for the product you're building. Is it narrowing it down too much? 
Is it opening the scope up too much? Is it creating a new puzzle for you to unravel? Ethnography, understanding user perspectives, putting yourself in their feet, immersion, trying things out, taking roles, and embodying those roles with your colleagues. And to wrap up, I'm going to leave you with a, a quote from one of my favorite authors, Margaret Atwood. She says, what I need is perspective, the illusion of depth created by a frame, the arrangement of shapes on a flat surface. Perspective is necessary, otherwise there are only two dimensions. And why I like that is because I think a lot of the work you do is to create a dimensionality into different disciplines through persuasion, through data, and through getting people recruited to a certain kinds of alignment and helping people on your team see things from the other's perspective. And so I thank you very, very much for your attention and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.